Hi folks, we're back with part two of lecture number three. We left off with a, a discussion of sharecropping and how the promise of the New South was really a lie in many respects. And in fact, race relations were slowly going from bad to worse by the time we get to the late 19th century, as disgruntled poor whites began systematically intimidating blacks politically as well as socially and economically through the passage of the so-called Jim Crow laws. Jim Crow laws were laws passed by the southern states to impose segregation between the races. It was a means of social control whereby fearful whites asserted their authority by telling blacks where they could and couldn't go. In many southern cities, hotels, restaurants, schools, orphanages, hospitals even, were segregated according to race. Jim Crow laws also tried to assert political control by preventing blacks from voting. This is what's meant by disfranchisement or by disfranchising blacks. That term simply means to deny the franchise to someone. The franchise is your ability to cast a ballot on election day. You can see the photograph here of a straw man, uh, a, a symbolic um, hanging in effigy of this straw figure that represents a potential black voter. And you can see uh, that the way they have treated the straw man, you know, is the way that they would treat an actual live human being who did not deserve torture and murder. And all of this to send a very clear message that blacks were not going to be able to vote. So let's take a look at some of the ways in which Southern whites prevented uh, freedmen from voting during this period. If you'll recall, we have a constitutional amendment, the 15th Amendment, which prevents states from barring voters based upon their race, skin color, or previous condition of servitude. If that's a federal law then, how are Southern whites getting around that law? they will look to things like grandfather clauses. They will ask a potential voter on election day, could your grandfather vote? For many freedmen, that answer was no. Their ancestors had, of course, been cruelly enslaved. For white voters, the answer was yes, of course. Well, then fine, sir, then you can go ahead and vote. Another way they tried to do an end run around the 15th Amendment was by requiring literacy tests of prospective voters. The idea here is that we're not discriminating against anyone based upon their skin color. We just want informed voters. We want literate voters. However, if these literacy tests had been applied equally to white voters as well as black voters, Many white voters would not have been allowed to cast their ballot because they were illiterate as well. And some of these literacy tests were so convoluted and complex that even if a potential voter did know how to read, they would not have been able to pass it. So they would ask questions about the interstate commerce clause. What does that mean from the Constitution? Or they would simply ask questions for which there was no correct answer. Questions such as, how many bubbles are there in a bar of soap? This is clearly ridiculous and a violation of the constitutional rights of black voters. And like I said just a moment ago, if these literacy tests had been applied equally across the board, most whites would also not have been allowed to vote, but they were selectively applied only to black voters. Another way in which Southern polling officials denied the ballot to black voters was by imposing poll taxes. You must pay a fee when you get to the poll on election day before you can cast your ballot. Knowing that, of course, former slaves who had very little property could not afford to pay such a fee. Again, if poll taxes had been applied equally to both white and black voters, many white voters also living in dire poverty could not have been able to participate on election day. But once more, this was selectively applied only to prospective black voters. Along those same lines, other districts began imposing property holding requirements. You must prove that you hold property that is, is at least valued at this amount of money before you can cast your ballot. So once more for freedmen, uh, this is a barrier. 
Such manipulation and jealousy by Southern whites poisoned race relations in the region during the period. Indeed, according to some observers, the situation for African Americans at the turn of the 20th century seemed to be growing worse than they had been during Reconstruction. Indeed, as black novelist Charles Chestnut remarked in 1903, the rights of the Negroes are at a lower ebb than at any time during the 35 years of their freedom, and the race prejudice more intense and uncompromising. White Southerners, however, weren't the only group of Americans involved in race-baiting and discrimination near the turn of the century. Whites in the Northeast, in addition to practicing their own form of segregation against African American families, were also becoming increasingly agitated over the larger immigrant population coming to the region. Nowadays, we like to pride ourselves on being a great melting pot strengthened rather than weakened by the influx of people from around the globe to our country. For the last few decades of the 19th century, though, such was not the attitude of most Americans. Instead, nativism will emerge as a strong social movement during the era. Nativism was an anti-immigrant movement that developed during this period as a backlash against rising immigration levels. You can see from the graph that I have here on the slide that we have several periods of, of high immigration from foreign countries into the United States during the 19th century. You see a precipitous spike, for example, in the 1840s, before the Civil War, of foreign immigrants. Many of those were Irish immigrants seeking to get away from the Irish potato famine. As their food source was compromised uh, back home in Ireland, many of these families faced a stark choice, stay and die slowly of hunger or board a ship and say goodbye to everyone that you've known and make a start for it somewhere else in the world. It's not surprising that we will see, with rising numbers of Irish immigrants in the early 19th century, a strong backlash against them. Now moving forward, as you can see here on the chart, we also have a, another high spike in foreign immigration in the 1870s and 1880s, and then another large surge in immigration around the turn of the 20th century. The nativist movement derived its name from the notion that if you were not native born here in the United States, if you were born into some other country and moved to the United States, that you were supposedly inferior, that you were coming to take people's jobs away, that you were coming to try and dilute the American character. And certainly at the heart of a lot of this anti-immigrant backlash was the fear of the job market being flooded by cheap labor. Some citizens were worried that uh, with an influx of Asian immigrants along the West Coast that these Chinese immigrants were willing to work for less and that it would depress wages for white workers in the same industry. They never bothered to reason through this, though, to understand that it was white employers that were hiring these Chinese employees at a far less rate. No one ever pointed the finger at the employers for exploiting the fact that many of these Chinese laborers didn't want to work for less, but they had no choice because they were new to the country. They had to put food on the table. There were many employers uh, also that refused to hire anyone of that was not an American. You, uh, a common sight during the period were signs advertising for a job in which it would say, no Irish need apply or no Italians need apply. Social anxiety also stoked the fires of nativism, with cities such as New York and San Francisco swelling in size exponentially to accommodate the large numbers of new arrivals coming in on steamships from all parts of the globe. Native-born residents of these metropolitan areas were soon finding themselves shoulder to shoulder with foreigners. They were worried that when they would walk down streets that they would hear foreign languages rather than English. It concerned them that many of these newest arrivals were not Protestant Christians. In the case of the Irish, for instance, they were largely Catholic. Or for Italian immigrants, they too were largely Catholic. For many Protestant Americans, this was automatically suspicious. 
They were even more suspicious of Jewish immigrants. They were even more suspicious of Chinese or Japanese immigrants to the United States who did not practice Christianity. As a result, certain incredibly negative stereotypes began to develop during the age about various ethnic groups. You can see the political cartoon that I have here from one of the most popular periodicals of the day, Puck Magazine. And you can see that it depicts the United States as sort of a boarding house, a lodging house. And how this depiction of Uncle Sam, he's, he's horrified. He's looking at all these various groups in the United States that have recently arrived. And he's worried that they're, they're just there to cause problems. You can see the negative stereotype of the Irishman here. Uh, it says no rent on his boot. In other words, that they're supposedly coming over here and taking advantage of the United States' hospitality and not giving anything back. You can see the depiction of the Irishman is, is bellicose. He looks like he's ready to jump up and start fighting Uncle Sam. He's got a, a bottle of rye whiskey there with him. Uh, you can see these terrible stereotypes. You can see next to him is the Chinese immigrant. They've depicted this uh, immigrant as smoking an opium pipe. This is not something that all Chinese immigrants were doing but it, uh, Chinese immigrants became unfairly associated with the opium trade and human trafficking. Uh, all these sorts of things only inflame uh, Americans and get them to write their legislators seeking immigration restrictions. And some of these campaigns to cut off various ethnic groups from even coming to the United States were successful. For example, in California, we will see the impetus for what will ultimately become national law seeking to exclude Chinese immigrants from the United States. Why are so many Chinese immigrants coming to the United States? To save their lives. From 1850 to 1865, political and religious rebellions in China left 30 million people dead, and the country's economy was in a state of free fall. Meanwhile, the canning, timber, mining, and railroad industries in the United States, especially along the West Coast, desperately needed workers. Chinese families, therefore, made the difficult, heartbreaking decision to leave their country uh, and seek a better life, seek a way to try to stay alive and ensure the future of their children. They come to the United States and very quickly Californians begin to resent and resist all of these latest arrivals. What starts in California ultimately becomes a national movement. So the U.S. Congress passes the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, which banned further immigration for both skilled and unskilled laborers from China. The Geary Act extended this initial piece of legislation for yet another 10 years in 1892, and by the Extension Act of 1904, the Chinese Exclusion Act was made permanent. In other words, we singled out a particular ethnicity, in this case the Chinese, and said no more. It doesn't matter if you're a doctor, it doesn't matter if you're a day laborer. Just because of your ethnicity, you cannot come to the United States. This act was not undone until we needed the assistance of the Chinese in World War II. This act was finally um, uh, struck down in 1943 when the United States desperately needed China's help in fighting off Japanese aggression in the Pacific.